Okay, we'll get started then. Uh, my name is Mika Hoffman. I'm with Excelsior College and I have with me Lori Graham. I'm also with Excelsior College and we're talking, as you can see, about um, using open educational resources to create pathways to an affordable degree. So moving right along, um, we're going to talk about credit, assessments and credit, and how to match OER and assessment, and then finally talk about putting all those pieces together to achieve a degree. And I should say, as a housekeeping issue, we'll keep an eye on the chat. If anyone has questions, please type them in as we go, and we'll try to address them as we move along and, and keep an eye on that. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Lori to talk about OER and credit. Hi there. Um, the characteristics of OER, I'm sure uh, many people have different ideas about what that is. Um, one of the unique features about OER is that it's open to everyone. Um, that the access is open and free, and for the most part they are unscheduled, which means that I can take a class here in upstate New York uh, that somebody else is taking on the other side of the world, and we can have a wonderful learning experience without ever having to step foot in the classroom. Um, one of the characteristics that can be a problem is that learners are anonymous, um, but there are also lots of opportunities for learners to interact with each other. OER has, in our mind, its own role to fill which is to keep it open. And it is possible that tying OER to credit it can put some barricades up to learning. Um, it would change the nature of the experience. It would create a system where somebody who has limited access might have no access if they have to verify their identity. Um, it might take someone who just wants to learn out of the picture, which I believe is what OER is all about, and that we believe OER should remain open. Now let's go on to talking about the traditional role of teaching and learning, which is the left-hand side of your screen, where you have the source of knowledge, which would be the instructor, and then the learning, which is the students. And that instructor is responsible for conveying what is to be learned, deciding what is to be learned, assessing whether it's been learned, and giving the person either a passing or failing grade, and the institution that that person works for awards the credit for it. With the disaggregated model, Learning can take place anywhere. The assessment is outside the learning. And then the certification of learning is done usually by the assessing body. And they all tie together with learning objectives. So I'm going to talk about how that happens. In the context of the traditional model, people didn't really think too much about what the credit means and how the assessment works as its own piece. But as we're advocating having learning be done in an open manner and having the assessment and credit be done separately, we need to articulate that a little bit better. So we work within a model of academic credit. That's the common currency of academia in the United States, um, which is where we are. And the way we think about it is not in the traditional Carnegie unit, it means you sat in class for a certain number of hours, but rather what that symbolizes is the assurance that, that you know something. So when an institution is accredited, it means they've been named as people who can, can understand what it means to learn something and who can form a good judgment about it. So what our job is as an accredited institution is to say, did our students really learn something? 
what we think of as credit is kind of a shorthand for if someone has a three credit course in intro psychology, what do we think would normally be learned in that course? And now let's measure what those learning outcomes are. So in order to fulfill our role in the credit system, we have to be pretty sure that the people coming through the system are who they say they are and that they are learning what they're supposed to be learning. So the way that works in the disaggregated model is our motto. What you know is more important than how or where, where you learned it. At the Center for Educational Measurement, which is where we work, we don't do assessments for specific courses. What we do is we say, wherever you learned what you know, we will assess that. We'll say, what is it that you do know? Here, we, will des we design assessments that reflect learning outcomes for the equivalent of a course, and then we go ahead and, and test that. So we're assessing knowledge, not what was presented in any given learning environment. And it's not that learning environments aren't important. Of course they're important. People need to have a good learning environment, but we also recognize that what constitutes a good learning environment is different for different people. And however they've arrived at the learning is fine with us. We're just testing whether they learned it. So there are, and there are a number of different ways to test that. Um, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with PLA. The reason we're talking about it here is we're really trying to talk about all kinds of assessment of prior learning, which could be individual exams at a college, it could be standard, standardized exams such as the ones we make, or por portfolio assessment. Any one of those is a fine way to determine whether somebody knows something. We're going to be focusing in our context on standardized exams because that's what we do. But what I'm going to talk about with appropriate assessment really goes for any of these methods that, that you have here. So we talk about validity. And I'm an assessment person. Validity is the number one concept we talk about. What we mean by that is you need to know who it is. The assessment itself needs to be of high quality, and that's a squishy term. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And it needs to test the knowledge that you actually need. Um, you can have a perfectly valid assessment of bungee jumping ability, and if that is relevant to whatever course of study you have, maybe if you're a physics major, okay, then that's fine. But if, it's, if you're a literature major, maybe bungee jumping is not so relevant and that's not something that would be appropriate to assess. So those the three elements of who's being assessed, how the assessment works, and what it's assessing, those are the important building blocks for making sure that what you're ending up with is credit that is useful. So just starting out with the identity verification, it's obvious, but it's not trivial. So when you have someone sitting in front of a teacher in a classroom, presumably the teacher knows who that person is and presumably can tell if a different person comes in and sits in, the, in that same person's spot. There's all kinds of ways that traditional classroom teachers verify identity, plagiarism, all kinds of uh, shifty goings on. None of those methods is perfect. For traditional, what I might call traditional online instruction, there are also ways of verifying identity. And again, nothing is completely foolproof. In the assessment world, um, we have proctored various ways of proctoring exams, but the identity verification is still an important piece of it. Even if I'm seeing a person sitting there doing an exam, I still need to know who that person is and make sure that that identity is tied to the person that wants to claim credit later. The assessment itself needs to, and again, this may sound obvious, but it needs to measure the knowledge of the subject and not irrelevant information. And those two together are surprisingly hard to make work properly. It's really easy to write an assessment of, say, mathematics or sociology that involves a lot of testing of, of somebody's reading skill, for example. Um, you have to be very careful when you're making assessments of whatever kind that you're really focusing on 
just what you're trying to focus on and not on something else. A portfolio assessment of somebody's knowledge in accounting might end up involving a lot of work with PowerPoint or formatting in Word or something like that that isn't relevant to what's being assessed. It's really important as you make those rubrics or as you construct your multiple choice assessment or whatever it is that you're doing to make sure that you're only focusing on the point that you really want to measure and not something else. The next point is also really important. This one is easier to deal with in standardized tests because what standardized means is precisely that they're designed to be equivalent forms. But even when you're talking about portfolio assessment um, or institutional challenge exams, you can take steps to make sure that you're rating people the same way, that you're using the same kind of rubrics, that you're not injecting subjectivity into the rating, all kinds of things like that can creep in and diminish the quality of the assessment. Um, and you want to give people the same ability, the same score. So again, you don't want to have one rater who's really lenient and another one who's really strict, and you end up with two people who might have the same ability getting completely different scores. Um, and that also can tie into not measuring irrelevant information. If you have people, two people who are equally good at calculus and you have a calculus exam, um, but it's very wordy and requires a lot of reading. The one who's a better reader might end up doing better, but that's not what you want to measure. Now, I see a comment on the chat, which is how, how do you determine what the knowledge areas are for the subject without an instructor? Um, and what I'll say to that is we don't have an instructor in the sense of somebody who's providing instruction. What we do have are content experts who set the test specifications for us. And this, I'm really glad that you raised that question. Before you even build an assessment, you have to know what it is that you're testing. You have to prepare learning objectives. You have to say, this is the content area that's being tested. And what we, we do, and what I would think anybody doing a good assessment would do, would be to bring in somebody who says, what does it mean to know intro psychology? What does it mean to know calculus? Um, what we do is we have a committee, we get some consensus on that, and we then publish those objectives, and I'll show you that in just a little while. It's, but, it's important to realize that when we say we bring in experts, we bring in instructional experts, we bring in faculty from other universities who teach these courses. So they have a background in, let's say, an intro to psych course or an intro to philosophy course. So we aren't just winging it. We, we take a broad look at what courses are out there. Our exams are not developed in a vacuum. Um, they, they look at everything that's out there and say, we want our exam to cover this. And I'll, I'll show you a slide a little further along that, that, um, that visualizes that a bit. Um, I just want to say a little bit about different types of exams because, as I said, everything that I've said applies to pretty much anything. As you choose what kind of assessment to use, there are a lot of things to take into consideration. So one of them is how generalizable it is. And this gets to, to your question, um, Amy. The, if you're only looking at one particular course, so for example, if you have a specific OER course that's, that's very much in a uh, narrow topic, then maybe what you want is a, an exam that's designed specifically for that topic. That's less generalizable. That doesn't mean it's bad. It just means you're going to be able to use that exam for that one course and probably not for anything else. Um, what, what we do is more generalizable competency assessments that are designed to be used with a wide variety of courses in a given area. We don't write exams ourselves for really narrow topics because that's just not what we do. Something like a portfolio assessment could be even narrower. And again, it all depends on what is being learned and how you want to bring that out. The advantage of more generalizable exams is that that way you can go to the work and expense of creating them once and then satisfy a lot of different courses.
resources with it. Um, there's a credit about a, a question about credits earned through our exams transferable. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later too, but the, the short answer is yes, they are. So we are a regionally accredited college. When people take our exams, it's the equivalent of a course for us. We transcript it directly on our transcripts, and those can be and are transferred anywhere that will accept those, those credits. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit more further on. One more element of different types of exams I want to talk about is the how many people you can scale to. So one thing that we're seeing with OER is a lot of places are able to do individual assessments in, in, in the sense of portfolios, research papers, oral exams. Somebody comes in and says, I have knowledge of wetland reconstruction techniques. And the, the institution says, great, that sounds useful, we'll test you. Um, and that can be very useful, again, for narrow topics. Even human score group assessments can be useful, but when you get to a vision of trying to help thousands or hundreds of thousands of people throughout the world learn something, it gets expensive and difficult to do some of those individualized assessments. They are useful for narrow subjects, for very particular cases, but what we would say is as any institution thinks about how to match assessments and OER, it's important to try to gain efficiency of scale where you can because we hope that the number of people taking advantage of learning opportunities is going to be huge. We need to make sure that our exams can keep up with that. Um, in addition, you really don't want the OER engine itself to have to handle all of this. This is a lot of work to put into the actual learning module um, for any kind of a course. And once you get up to huge numbers of students, it gets to be very burdensome. Um, so one advantage of disaggregating the assessment from the instruction is that you can have a lot of large-scale assessments that can be done very efficiently. So getting back to our diagram again, um, before I turn it back over to Lori, just getting back to the issue of determining what the knowledge areas are. That's where we see that red arrow. The learning objectives are the central focus of, of everything. Any kind of learning and any kind of assessment has to have learning objectives in mind. It's fine to learn something without objectives, and that's fun and, and interesting, but if you want to give credit for it, if you want to show it as part of a degree program, you really need to say, what exactly is it that we expect? And to be able to define that, to say, here's what we're assessing. So what we're going to talk about next, or what Lori's going to talk about next, is how those learning objectives play into the whole situation. Um, I beg to disagree with you. I think all learning has an objective, whether it's been formalized or not, is something else. That's a good point. I, uh, I've worked in uh, SEM for several years, and um, the exam development process is a fascinating process. Um, but when these faculty members get together to decide what the exam is going to test, they come up with a description and learning outcomes. And in this case, it's the principles of finance. And you can see it says you're going to be able to identify, apply, explain, describe. <coughs> and you'll find these in, the con in content guides for each exam. They give the framework for somebody doing transfer credit to decide whether it has met the criteria. And that is where we start with trying to decide whether an OER is a good fit, or even just pieces of the OER are a good fit to our exam. And you'll see our content outline, which is part of the content guide, is broken down further. It's good to have objectives, but they're kind of squishy. So we give students a detailed outline of 
what it is we expect them to know. And you'll notice that, ooh, try the little, try the little pointy thingy. You'll notice that um, over here it shows 34 hours. Um, and that it tells you what chapters of the recommended text are involved. In this case, it's 34 hours, and it's chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 10, 16, and 18. And if you look a little further, you see it's broken down, just like those outlines we had to do in elementary school that drove me crazy, um, so that the student has an idea of how much time to spend on this particular unit, and what kinds of things to expect to be tested on. It also gives somebody who is awarding transfer credit an idea of what was learned by the student. When we go to do learning resources, learning resources for this exam, the faculty who develop the exam go through many textbooks. And they also go through any open courseware including textbooks, YouTube videos, iTunes, all of that, to see what would be useful for a student. This, in this case, they chose this recommended textbook because it covered the majority or all of what was being tested. And then we reviewed the courseware that you see listed. And then if you notice, we also have started saying that, you know, if you lack the prerequisites and you still want to take the test, take, take these Sailor Foundation courses. When we identify courses from different open courseware, we include them in the content guide as a possible learning resource because everybody learns differently. We also have a guide to open educational resources, which gives students an idea of what OERs have been matched to which exams, so that they can make a reasonable judgment as to how much it really is going to cost to study for this course. Textbooks are expensive, and we are trying very hard to match as many open online resources as we can for students so that they can earn a degree that is affordable to them that is of high quality. <clears throat> when I go to match an OER to one of our assessments, the first thing I do is a search for the topic, uh, ethics, theory, and practice. There are a lot of ethics courses out there. A lot of them are very specific. Trying to find one that's broad, an OER that's broad, is, is rather difficult. If a student had to do that, it would take them, well, they'd quit. Um, so part of what we do is, oh, good question. <laughs> the, the exam guidelines, or the exam guides, if you go to excelsior.edu, which is, uh, thank you, Igor, uh, slash 668, you will get um, a link to the content guides. Yeah, you can also type in exam content guides in the search bar if that doesn't work and find them. They're free. Um, anybody can, can download them. You don't have to purchase the exam to get them. Um, they are all in PDF. And so you can either save them to your computer or look at them or print them out. It, it doesn't matter. So when we do this, oh, thank you, Amy. So when we do this, um, what I do is I search for OER content. And then I do the physical looking through whatever the OER is, whether it is a full course or whether it's a series of lectures or an online textbook. And I look to see if the outcomes and the content seem to match. I'm not a content expert in, in 
much of what we do. My, my degree is in school psychology, and that doesn't help much with calculus. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, I couldn't do calculus to save my life. Um, but I have been in education for quite a while, and I am able to do a reasonably good evaluation of what should go on to a content expert. And then once a content expert says, yes, it matches, or yes, it sort of matches, it's missing this and that, then we publicize the match in the content guide and in the OER guide. And there is also the possibility of using OER to determine what the content will be of a new exam. And I should um, also mention at this point, by publicize the match, when we have partnerships with providers of OER, um, once we've made a match, they may also indicate that, that, there, that there's a match. So if you go to um, Sailor, the Sailor Foundation, sailor.org, you can see that some of their courses, they have said, by the way, this one matches to an Excelsior College exam or a UXL exam or whatever kind of exam it is. So we're encouraging OER providers who are interested in helping learners get credit to find those assessments out there that, that match up. And not just our exams, but, but other exams as well. We would really want to encourage any provider of OER that is interested in helping learners get credit to um, take a look at, at what's out there and, and provide that information. Um, moving along, I'm going to talk now about putting the pieces together. So we've talked about how we go about looking at the different learning resources out there and how we can match them up to exams. And again, going back to what I said earlier about scalability, if you have a very specific course and, a, and an exam that's just designed for that course, it's a lot easier to do that. Our job is to try to make things that are going to be more broadly usable, so it's a lot more work for us to go and try to look at everything that's out there and figure out what matches. Um, but regardless of whether it's easy or hard, even if you've got a fantastic assessment of some kind and you really know whether the, the learner knows something, you still have to test something that's relevant for the course of study. So just accumulating a whole bunch of credits is not going to do people any good when it comes to building a degree. A degree is not just credits. It's you have to take prerequisites for your major. You have to take distribution requirements. Whatever your educational institution requires, it's a curriculum. It's not just a random collection of, of things. So the next step is once you have all that, how do you put it all together? Before I, um, before I go on and talk about how, how we do it, focusing almost exclusively on OER and exams, certainly you can put together a degree from a number of different sources. And at Excelsior, we encourage that. You can transfer credits from other classes, from other educational institutions. You can transfer credits in from exams. You can take challenge exams, you can do portfolios. There's all kinds of ways you can put a lot of different elements together um, to satisfy the degree requirements. But what we're going to focus on here is our exam-based degree path. So what we've done is we've identified a couple of majors that are relatively popular and that we've got, we can develop exams for relatively easily and have a supportive independent study model where we have the OER guide, we have the content guides, we say, here's how you can study, and when you're ready, you can take an exam. So these are degree paths that we have for a Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Arts in Local Studies, um, an Associate of Science and Bachelor of Science in, in General Business, all of these can be done almost entirely by exam. What I'll show you next is our degree pathways. And it's kind of small, but we wanted to put that up there so you can see how we've done it. So on the left-hand side, these are the requirements for our degrees in our 
programs. Obviously, other colleges might have slightly different requirements, but the point is that the left-hand side defines the curriculum that's set up for the degree. This is not set up specifically for an exam-based degree. It's set up for the degree. And what we have on the right-hand side is different ways you can satisfy it, just as you might choose from among a bunch of courses to get to your degree in a traditional setting, these are exams that have been matched to OER that you can use to satisfy the degree requirement. So this first one is the Liberal Studies Bachelor's Degree, 120 credits, and you can see the various exams that are set up. It does have one of Excelsior's requirements. We do have a, a one credit information literacy course that has to be satisfied by a course. And we also have a capstone. Um, we also have a capstone that has a requirement um, to. Sorry, that was my phone ringing. We have a capstone requirement that is also course only. So those are two things that can't be fulfilled through open educational requirements and exams, but everything else can. Um, the next few slides show you some other degrees. Um, I'll get to the cost in just a minute. Let me just show you. This is the business one. So this is a general business degree. Um, the question is, what kind of support do we give for the independent study and what is the cost? The first question, part of the support is the content guides where we really try to find good open educational resources. In terms of physical or emotional support, um, learning support, we have a partnership with uh, Open Study, which is a social media site that's designed to support people studying. And you can sign into Open Study and ask questions, get peer support from on any number of subjects. And um, I would highly recommend that. We also have, for our own enrolled students, this is something you would actually have to be enrolled at Excelsior to take advantage of these, but we do have academic advisors. Um, and they serve all enrolled students, not just ones taking courses. So you can talk to your advisor. Um, the advisor can say, how are you doing? I noticed you haven't taken an exam in a while. Do you need help? Um, we have um, we have a few services that Excelsior provides, such as Smart Thinking. We have um, the OWL, which is the Online Writing Laboratory, which is an open source, an, an, an open educational resource for writing. So we have a number of things that are available to support students. The um, thank you for posting the link to Open Study. Um, because it's exam based, it is independent study. We are not designing this the way, for example, WGU does, which is to really have a mentorship relationship. We're trying to keep costs down, essentially, by making this be for more independent learners. And it's not for everyone. People who really need to have a lot of support through the whole process, who maybe aren't so good at motivating themselves to sit down and study, this may not be the right choice for them. But for those who can go to that OER, get themselves to open study, talk to an advisor, um, this offers a, a low cost alternative. And in terms of the cost, you can get a bachelor's degree. If you don't have any, any credits coming into transfer, you can get a bachelor's degree for about $10,000 for the four year degree. Well, I say for your degree, how long it takes, of course, is up to the learner because it's entirely flexible. But for a bachelor's degree, you can get a bachelor's degree for under $10,000. Most of our exams cost $95, and that's for three credits. Most of them are three credits and $95. Some of the ones, especially the six credit ones, cost more than that, but they're all significantly cheaper than a course. And if you add it all up together with the various requirements and enrollment fees and so forth, it comes to around ten thousand dollars for the whole degree. Um, it's, just, it's important to know that um, a student does not have to be, or a learner does not have to be an Excelsior student in order to take our exams. They are open to anyone who wants to take them. Right, they and do. you don't need to be enrolled um, to complete a lot of your credits. 
<coughs> excuse me. Right, you do need to be enrolled to get a degree. Right. So if you want a degree from us, you do need to enroll at some point. But you could take exams without being enrolled for a very long time and then decide to enroll near right. the end and, and just use all of those credits that you've accumulated to um, complete the degree. Um, so I hope that answers the, the question. Um, so it's not free, but it's about as low cost as we can make it. Um, and the $95 per exam incidentally includes test administration fees. Our exams are delivered in person at uh, Pearson View testing centers, and they have testing centers worldwide. Um, and that's to ensure the security and integrity of the exams. But those fees are included in the, in the test fee so that there aren't any hidden costs. So you have to pay a test fee, and then you have to go and pay an administration fee. We don't do that. Um, the question is, if someone doesn't want credits but a certificate of some sort, that, is that possible? Um, I suppose it would be. All our exams automatically, the price of the exam in, includes having it transcripted. So when you go in and take the exam, you get a piece of paper that gives you your grade on the exam and says that you've taken it. So if you didn't want to order a transcript from us or enroll and you just wanted to say, yes, I've taken this exam, then you could certainly do that. But, but we don't give a certificate. Cert a certification that you have taken it other than I mean, that's the, grade, the grade report. Right, the grade, I took it. the grade report in the transcript is the certificate. I would say if someone doesn't want credits, um, then I'm not sure they would want to take an exam necessarily. I mean, they might, if, if they actively said, I don't want credits, I really don't want to have credits lying around, then they wouldn't want to take the exam. The, the, tra the transcript does play the role of, um, of a certification. So for example, um, some employers who want a, a proof that you know something would certainly accept an academic transcript as, as proof. It might be overkill. So I would say for people who don't necessarily need that level of, of proof, they might want to look for something else. But you know, working professionals for retraining purposes, it's probably overkill, but it probably wouldn't hurt. Yeah, but it's, it's like if people need the continuing, what are those called? Continuing education credits? Yes, the continuing education units um, to keep their certifications. Yes, these, these if they're in the right area, these are yeah, perfectly these, valid. Right, and they'll certainly work for that. So people can certainly use our credits to, sh to prove that they've learned, they've learned this. Um, and, just, and educators do use some of our exams for that to keep their teaching certifications. That's right. We have an exam on literacy instruction in the elementary school, and I'm willing to bet that most people who take that exam don't do it for the credits. They're doing it to, to, you, to keep their certification. Right. And, and we are developing an exam in uh, yeah. Yes. science, technology. Mm -hmm. no? Engineering and math, yeah, yeah. So there, there. We're looking at a number of other exams in the sort of continuing ed uh, domain that people might use for those purposes. But we talked earlier about currency. What we, what we do, our reason for being is to provide credit-bearing exams. So that's what we do. We do, incidentally. Um, there are other units at Excelsior College that offer continuing education courses with their own certificates, but those are a separate department um, for the purposes of looking at degree programs and OER, that's, that's what we do here. Um, just to quickly look, these are the associate's degrees, here's the liberal studies, 60 credits, um, and it's more of the, the same. It's, I'm just sort of showing them for completeness. And here's the business associate's degree. So right now, we've got those four degrees, two associates, two bachelors, that can be done almost entirely by using OER and, and exams. The final thing then that we want to show you as a diagram, this is from the OER University, OERU, of which Excelsior College is a member. 
and this is their basic model for low-cost education. So you have your learners, and then the OER University Network will, pro will provide free OER learning. But that OER learning could come from outside the OER University Network as well. Obviously, part of the nice thing about OER is it can come from anywhere. So that the learning happens for free through whoever is providing the OER. Then the formal education sector, which would be accredited institutions, provides the quality assurance, the, net, the institutional accreditation, and that is a fee for service because there's a lot more involved with making that happen, the individual verification of identity, the um, everything that has to go into making the exam content secure so that it actually measures something. One thing I might point out is, although we're big fans of open, um, generally people in testing are not big fans of spreading our test questions out so all the world can see it because then you're not measuring what you want to measure. When I talked earlier about a good assessment has to measure what it's supposed to measure and not other things, you definitely don't want an assessment that measures whether someone has seen the questions before and memorized them. That's not what you want to measure. So we aren't open. We keep it very closed. We expect security and we don't want people to see our materials ahead of time. So that's, that's and that costs more than making things available for free. Well, not only that, but when an institution like Excelsior College goes through accreditation, our exams have a separate accreditation, which is expensive. Right. All of the degree programs have to go through accreditation, or I should say all the schools. Mm -hmm. So, And that is a very expensive process. Right. So again, I think that's the, the model is you can do a lot of wonderful scalability with content, putting all of the bureaucratic mechanisms in place to make sure that the assessment is done according to good quality assurance standards, that's what costs the money. We keep the costs as low as we can. And then at the end, what you get are the credible qualifications. Right, and our exams are updated every few years um, for currency and also for exposure. So I'm constantly looking for OERs for our exams because they are constantly under development. Right, that's another, um, Lori is kept very busy making sure that the resources that she's found before are still there, still there, and that all the links work, <laughs> right. and, that, and that they're still relevant. So, um, so this diagram really just shows the basic model um, for how we think that the degree pass can work. So getting back to the question of professional certification, that's an important point. That's not what we're focusing on here. What we're saying here is this is a way to get a degree for a very low cost by using OER. And to get back to what Lori said earlier, we believe that the disaggregated model is the way to do it because it keeps the learning open and free and allows for people to come in, leave, do whatever they need to do or want to do to learn um, and doesn't try to burden the learning resources with all of the mechanisms that are required to make good assessments. And if we, we make beautiful assessments that are high quality, but our, our department does not teach. That's what we rely on the OERs for. And um, up until OERs became a viable option, the only students who were taking our exams and successful were those who were driven to be independent learners. Really independent, as in willing to read a textbook cover to cover. Right. We're so excited that now we have things like Open Study and the Sailor Foundation um, and some of the other places that put things together and make things more engaging. Right. Um, it's really um, been a great boon for our students who don't have the time to go to class, who don't have the schedules to go to class, um, and who don't have the money to go to class. So you know, we have a lot of military and people who work odd shifts. 
All right, we'll go to questions now. So we kind of looked at all the slides. So how do we verify the identity of people taking exams online? Um, we send people to Pearson View Testing Center. So what happens there is they go into the testing center. They have to show uh, an approved government ID. They have palm vein scans. Um, there are all kinds of things that they have to go to go through to, to prove who they are. And then they have to sit there, then they are under physical observation, so they can't just leave and have their cousin come in and take their test for them. So that's how we verify. And they aren't allowed to take anything into the test with them. That's so, right. So no cell phones, no bags and paper. Right. So we so by doing that we both verify identity and make sure they're not cheating. Um, the next question, do we have data on success in transferring credits for students? We don't have complete data because we, we do have data on where people ask that their transcripts be sent. And there are about 1,800 institutions to which our transcripts have been sent. We don't always get feedback on yes, it was accepted or no, it wasn't. Um, we don't get a lot of students complaining to us that, hey, I thought this would transfer in, and it didn't. So we're assuming that in most of the cases, those 18, um, 1,800 institutions have accepted the, the credit. What we do advise is we tell anybody who wants to take an exam and transfer the credit somewhere, they should probably check with their institution to make sure that they're going to take it. Another thing that we're starting to work on is working with other institutions to have them make their credit transfer policies more transparent. It's sometimes very difficult for students to figure out what their institution's policy is. So we really like to see more transparency there mm -hmm. so that whether an institution takes it or not, it's pretty clear. We do know that there are some state systems that have rules and regulations about accepting transfer credit. So the state of Florida has a list of some of our exams that it requires any college or university in its state system to accept. Um, there are other states, I think, that, that have similar kinds of regulations. But again, they're not always very transparent. It's not always easy to see what's going on there. So I think the short answer to the, to the question is we don't have very good data on success unfortunately. But then I don't I get a lot of complaints. And I can't stress enough that if somebody is thinking about taking one of our exams, they really do need to check with their home institution. I worked at a, a university in central New York and um, we wouldn't have taken uh, CLEP exams. We did take uh, advanced placement credit. But I can remember one student coming to me and wanting to fulfill a biology degree with human sexuality. And at the time, the college I worked for did not accept that as a biology course. And uh, the student was really upset because that was what the student wanted to do in order to fulfill that science requirement. But it, it wasn't going to happen. I'm assuming that times have changed since I left there a few years ago. But you never know. What I, I don't know. I mean, it's a it's a huge institution, and it probably takes a long time to change its minds. I know when I went to U Albany here, um, they wouldn't take a lot of transfer credits. And I think there there are a number of colleges that are transfer friendly. So Excelsior is certainly one of them. Charter Oak State College in Connecticut, Empire State College, um, which is part of the State University of New York system, Thomas Edison State College. There are a number of places out there that accept a lot of transfer credit generally, and they'll all take they'll all take our exams. Right, right. Sure. and we and the amount of residency requirement by different schools is also a variable. And, and Empire State requires a 30 or 36 hour residency, right. and many places have differences as to what they'll accept depending on what your major is. So some of them will accept transfer credits for general education requirements, but they won't accept transfer credits for, you know, your major. And that was what, when I was in so Central New York, we did not accept credit, transfer credit for your major at right. all. So I think there's, so again, 
anybody who wants to transfer credit needs to get the cooperation of their institution. The next question, um, so as I said, the testing centers do not charge anything to do their part. Actually, they don't charge. They do. They don't charge the student. They charge us. So we have a we have a, we have um, a partnership with Pearson View. They charge us a fee every time someone comes in to take the exam, but we don't charge that to the student. So when you pay ninety five dollars, that covers the administration fee. So once you pay the ninety five dollars, that's the only fee that you need to pay when. When you pay that, then you get a letter that's, or you get a, an authorization number that says you can take this to the Pearson Center, and then they'll look at it and they'll say, "Great, you don't owe anything else. Schedule your appointment." Mm -hmm. Are there other questions? You're very welcome. <laughs> I, I was very surprised to see that. Um, CLEP. We do on our website offer information about the CLEP and the uh, what used to be called Dante's. DSST. And I was very surprised to find that they do charge a sitting fee. Right. So if you over look, and above. Well, because they they administer them in different places. So if you take a CLEP exam, they have an exam fee, which I believe is eighty five dollars. And then if you go to uh, a college, maybe it's twenty dollars. If you go somewhere else, maybe it's thirty-five. It depends. So that's why they separate it. Oh, thank you, Amy. Um, <laughs> are are you with a college? Are you a learner? I think. Yeah, I have no idea who these people are. <laughs> hey, they don't know who we are either. <laughs> I, I noticed that um, we neglected to put um, oh oh wonderful wow. we neglected to put our content information on the slides. I'm going to type that into the chat box now so that you can have that in case you want to contact contact us afterwards. Make sure I'm typing it correctly. So, please, if anyone has additional uh, questions or comments, feel free to email either of us, and we will be happy to answer. Yes. And I understand that the presentation is going to be made available as well, in case you want to um, look at it again or share it um, with whoever you want to share it with. Well, I thank you for everyone attending. Thank you both. This has been a great presentation. We will, uh, we did record the session and we will make it available on the schedule on the Open Education Week website as soon as we've converted it to YouTube. So if you'd like to come back and look at it for reference or tell your colleagues about it, they uh, can access it any time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank well, you. We will sign out then. Thank you everybody for coming.